Today's video is gonna be the third part in the series about what is an open BMS system. And even when you do have a multi-vendor product that can be maintained by multiple companies, how building owners still get locked in either on purpose or by accident. In today's video, I had an idea of what the third part would be. However, in the last couple of weeks, I've noticed some really good comments on LinkedIn and they reminded me of some really big problems that I've also had in the past. So in today's video, I'm gonna just further discuss and expand on what those two comments were. So the first comment was from Tom. He's actually a customer of mine, so I've got a pretty good idea of exactly which jobs he's talking about here. In the first part, he's talking about situations where, you know, this is BMS maintenance, and they're doing retendering or whatever they're doing, and they get fee proposals from BMS companies. And a BMS company will, in the proposal, will list out there that we can support all of these different BMS systems. I always find it pretty interesting because when you look down the list, half of them are BMS systems that nobody can maintain except for this one company, which is not them. So in the past, I've you know, in tender interviews, I've said, can you please explain this? All these different BMS systems, can you buy these exact controllers for these companies, these systems? And do you have all the engineering tools licensed to support the product? And they always say, uh, no, we, we're not agents for those systems. We can't buy those controllers. However, across our service department, we have different service technicians that used to work for those companies in the past. That is not the same as being a proper licensed company to maintain a product. And then when I've said to them, okay, talk me through if this controller from this brand, if it fails, what do you do? And they usually say, well, we can't buy that exact controller. So we'll pull it out and we'll put in one of our controllers, a new brand, a different brand, we'll introduce a different product into the site. This is the controller that we can support. We can't actually buy that the controller. And that actually sort of leads me on to the last part of what he talks about, which is the real problem, in my opinion. Um, what's happened is there are situations where, and I'll use Tritium Niagara again as an example, because I think this is the one that Tom's talking about. Um, they'll have a site that has, for example, Tritium Niagara plus Distech field controllers and doing maintenance, you know. Then five years later, for whatever reason, a Tritium Niagara agent comes to the facility manager and says, hey, we're Niagara agents and you have a Niagara site, we can do maintenance here. And they take over maintenance. However, they are not a DizTech agent. They are, you know, maybe like an easy IO agent. So because they can't actually work on the DizTech controllers, although there's a whole group of other agents that can, um, as there's minor projects on site or expansions or upgrades or got to fix things, because they can't work on the distech controller, they start putting in easy IO controllers as works are happening over many years. And then another five years later, for whatever reason, the maintenance changes again, and a third Tritium Niagara agent comes along and says, hey, we're a Niagara agent, your site's Niagara, we can maintain your BMS. But they're silent about the field controllers because they are perhaps Honeywell Webs or some other product you know, a Johnson's product or something else like that. They are Niagara, but they've got a different field controller and they can't support Distech or EasyIO. And this really happens. I've seen real sites like this, that there's three different types of field controllers across a large site. And this has evolved like this over a 10 or 15 year cycle. So the problem is now that the incumbent provider can only support, let's say one third of the field controllers. And if Tom wants to do a building-wide energy efficiency project, that's a big problem because now they have to engage all three companies to do the to change the control strategies for the optimization work in the different groups of field controllers. And to get three competing companies to collaborate and proactively coordinate between all three of them with them all working in the database of the JACE and on the graphics it's a big problem that. So be very careful when companies tell you we can maintain all of these systems. Ask them, how can you maintain that system? Can you buy 
those exact controllers. What is the products that you're using? Just like we discussed in the previous video. The second comment that I want to discuss was from Kevin and just the second part where he says, <laughs> I can't stop laughing because I've recorded this piece about five times and instead of saying BTL, I keep saying BLT, bacon, lettuce and tomato. Let's try again. The supplied system shall be a fully discoverable BTL listed backnet system. Now we're not going to get into BTL because that's a whole video on its own. But I wanted to talk about in detail here was discoverable. So there must be a fully discoverable backnet system. So let me give you two examples of where this has been a humongous issue. The first was there's a very big company in Australia and hundreds, probably thousands of buildings, when they configure their field controllers, hundreds of them, and they're writing the software code in the field controller, all of the inputs and outputs, you know, temperature sensors and pressure, valve actuators, damper actuators, the thousands of points, when you configure the controller in the definition of the input or the output, you're supposed to type a unique identifier in there, a unique name to describe that it's air handling unit one, supply air temperature sensor one. So you're supposed to write a unique backnet name in the configuration of all the inputs and outputs, and they don't do that. So when you go to their BMS system and you do an auto discovery and you're sucking in hundreds and hundreds of points into a cloud-based system, what happens is instead of all these unique names coming in for AHUs and chillers and boilers and all these sensors, all you get is 200 points called AI1, AI2, AI3, hundreds of points called DI1, digital input one, hundreds of points called AO1, analog output one, two, three, four. You can't do anything with it because you've got a thousand points, but you don't know what they're called because the names never came through because they didn't actually put a name in there. Let's not get into why that happens, but it's a massive issue with this particular system. And for the people, and I'm, I'm just guessing that Kevin's talking about that as one of his examples, um, you can't integrate to these systems. Or if you do, it's going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars of more engineering work to get all the points list to find out that network controller 7, controller 14, input 3, page through it, input 3 is air handling unit 1, cooling valve. Right, so that's a massive problem. So that's what he's talking about. It must be discoverable. First thing, maybe, I'm, I'm guessing. I'm, I'm guessing what he's thinking about. The second part I've had, problem I've had is massive construction project with a global manufacturer. I never like to say that, but I'm gonna this time. It's a manufacturer. They have amazing, fully compliant backnet field controllers, amazing, fully compliant network controllers. The whole thing is awesome. However, in this particular project, just to be fair, was delivered by an agent of the manufacturer's product. It wasn't actually the manufacturer doing the job, it was an agent. And what happened was all the backnet controllers that they were building through into the database of the network controllers, they were putting, dragging all these controllers and all the points not in the backnet folders within the network controller, they were saving them into the other folders which are not backnet folders. So what happened was they built an entire BMS system, an entire backnet system, but when it tried to do an auto discovery, there was nothing there because there was no points built into the backnet folders. So I thought this was pretty bad. So I went and spoke to the manufacturer, actually to the engineers, because they're more honest than managers of companies. I said, how does this happen? How is it that these companies, and it turns out even the manufacturer's engineers were also making this mistake, and he said to me, Brass, you know, our training courses that were developed 10, 15, 20 years ago before BACnet told us when we create these systems and all the architecture and we import all the controllers and all the points into our network controllers, we should put them in these folders. When the BACnet products came along a very long time ago, they didn't redo the training courses that said that all of this needs to now go in these folders, the BACnet folders, not these folders. So another situation of where everything is backnet, it's just not properly engineered. And this happens 
by accident. Nobody is going to do it on purpose. So that particular start that I'm talking about, I'm actually not going to tell you what happened because the people will be able to put pieces together here, but you get the point of what I'm talking about. So that's it. Um, those are the two comments I wanted to further expand on. There's a lot of good comments actually in this LinkedIn post, so go check it out if you haven't already. I'm thinking that I probably won't do the next part of this series. I had a plan for a third video, which was this video. Um, we've done three of these. I'm getting a bit bored of this topic, so I want to move on to something else. Um, if you're really interested in open systems and all the, the loopholes and all the things that catch you out, comment below. Maybe I'll do a couple more of them. But for now, let's put this on hold for a bit and move on to something else. For those that follow me on LinkedIn, you may have noticed I've launched two massive BMS training courses in February next year. Advanced BMS Maintenance and BMS Design. These are really good courses. I'm really excited about them. They should have happened earlier. It's just that I had way too much consulting workload this year and I, I couldn't do training. I also didn't do many of YouTube videos in the first half of the year. I stopped quoting consulting work about six months ago. I'm trying to reduce that work. Next year, going to go hard on training coaching and mentoring so see in the description below if you're interested otherwise thank you for watching and i will see you in a couple of weeks